Thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here in Santa Barbara, or as I have been thinking about it since last night, the frozen north. <laughs> I actually come from Canada, so I actually come from the frozen north. But anyway, uh, I was given the rather ponderous title of Dark Matter Overview Models and Motivation. Let's see what I can do with that. I have a question before we start for Tao Han. This is Snowmass, and there's something that goes after it. And what is that? Is this still Snowmass 2021? Okay, <laughs> good to know. All right, I see many jokes coming up about Snowmass 2021 and 2022. So a little bit of motivation. This audience doesn't really need much in the way of motivation. Of course, we know that there is dark matter. At this point, the evidence comes from many different observation scales many different uh, types of observations. It is really hard to imagine that there is not some kind of dark matter that makes up most of the matter in our universe. Even XKCD knows that. Which is funny, but it's also actually what's written here is false. So anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, so this just remind us, reminds us that when we construct theories of dark matter, we have to make sure that they match what very little we know about it. I think many of you have probably seen me show this slide before. Uh, this is a sculpture which is called Cold Dark Matter and Exploded View. It's by Cornelia Parker. It's in the Tate Modern Museum, but Tate is spelled incorrectly, so don't be confused. Uh, and yeah, I don't know really what it tells me about dark matter, but I, what it really convinces me is that we have to figure it out so we can tell the art world. All right. As of 2013, this is a slide I actually showed at Snowmass 2013, and sort of my theme here in organizing things was thinking about where we were in 2013 for that Snowmass and where we are today, where we're going. I think actually there's been a lot of progress and that's very inspirational. And it also kind of characterizes how I think dark matter as a subject and dark matter models in particular fit in to the, uh, to the theory frontier of Snowmass 2021. <laughs> I also have to tell you, I'm department chair, which means I've never actually lectured with a mask on, and I have a lot of more respect than I uh, used to uh, for all of my colleagues that have been doing this for, for the last couple of years. Uh, you probably also know that you can buy dark matter online. It costs about $60 or so. That's a lot cheaper than the LHC, as it turns out. Uh, apparently, it builds muscle mass, so I don't know if that tells us the dark matter is a wimp or isn't a wimp. I'll let you figure that one out. Um, it's available in blue raspberry fruit punch and grape flavors. I have to remind you that if there are three flavors of dark matter, like there are three flavors of other kinds of matter, we have to lobby really hard to make these the flavors. Uh, the other thing, I have a colleague in Korea who actually bought this stuff. He said his kids like it. Um, and he also tried it himself and said that it's absolutely disgusting, which I think he probably should have been able to guess. Okay, so. In the way of sort of providing an overview, I'm gonna start off a little bit by talking about how we think about learning about dark matter. Um, we have sort of four big general directions that we use experimentally to try to infer uh, information about dark matter. Indirect detection, right, is dark matter annihilating and producing something that we can detect. Uh, it may be annihilating far away, like at the center of our galaxy, right? It relies on the fact that while the dark matter in general, in the cosmos is too diffuse to be annihilating efficiently today. We live in galaxies, which are big over densities of dark matter. And of course, there we may have reached the critical density to start seeing it again. Direct detection is trying to look at the ambient dark matter that's around us and see it scattering uh, with detectors made out of ordinary matter like us. Collider searches try to use E equals MC squared to turn large energies at the LHC uh, into dark matter and other new states. Um, we've already had some discussion about this kind of thing. And of course, uh, the dark matter may have interesting properties itself. I mean, I cartoon this as self interactions. This type of probe is fundamentally different because it lives entirely in the dark sector. And you know, you might also, instead of thinking about self interactions, maybe the dark matter actually annihilates between different species that have different masses. Maybe it can radiate some kind of dark radiation. All of these things can actually be probed by the structures of uh, galaxies. Uh, and so, for example, uh, LSST is uh, something coming along online very soon that will tell us about that. Sorry, the Vera, Vera Rubin Observatory. 
Uh, I don't think I'm actually going to go through any of these in great detail. I have them here just to remind us, right? Uh, but I think I probably said enough about them already. The point to say, though, is that there is a very rich experimental program. So here we've got the Fermi Large Area Telescope, which is nearing the end of its life, looking at uh, sort of GeV to 100 GeV gamma rays. And of course, IceCube is looking for um, even higher energy neutrinos at the South Pole. Uh, and there's lots of constraints on what dark matter can be based on, say, looking at annihilating in uh, dwarf spheroidal galaxies and not seeing any signal of gamma rays. This allows you, depending on how the dark matter uh, annihilates and what its mass is, to put a constraint on what the cross-section for the annihilation is allowed to be. Uh, this is actually a recent thing that combined several different gamma ray observatories together to get a, a kind of a composite picture that covers more, that does a better job over a wide range of masses. And of course, famously, there is an excess of gamma rays from the, uh, the galactic center, and we still don't really understand what it is. While it may be that it's not dark matter, um, the jury is really still out to some extent on that. Direct detection, of course, is uh, looking at dark matter recoiling off of what is usually a heavy nuclei, though uh, nowadays we also have uh, new uh, ideas for detector technologies that use things like scattering off of electrons or even scattering off of excitations inside the materials themselves. Uh, that's very exciting. It's also caused even us phenomenolo phenomenologists to start uh, having to learn condensed matter theory. Um, it's good for us. And this is a picture, again, that came from SNOMAS 2013. It was the roadmap for where these experiments uh, were going. You can see that uh, at the time, right, the solid curves were existing uh, bounds, the dash curves were projections. We're now down sort of around the xenon one ton uh, um, regime. We're getting close to the neutrino floor. At this point, these detectors will actually become positive detectors of neutrinos. Uh, we're pretty sure what's going to happen when they start seeing solar neutrinos. We're less sure about um, what's going to happen from the background of supernova. Uh, it will mean that we'll keep learning things, but of course it does mean it's going to be harder to, to discover dark matter using them at that point. Not impossible, perhaps. Uh, and of course, colliders don't actually have a very easy time seeing dark matter because the collider detectors are not designed for it. Uh, they have to see the momentum imbalance when they're created. Uh, and so therefore, collider detectors actually have to infer their presence uh, in a way that's much more easy if they're produced relativistically. Uh, whereas direct detection and indirect detection are relying on the ambient dark matter, which we know is non-relativistic because it is stuck in our galaxy. Uh, and here's some examples of uh, what these look like, putting bounds on uh, the plane of the mass of the dark matter and say the mass of some particle mediating its interactions with quarks. Uh, and um, sort of putting bounds on, on it, assuming something about the cross-section. I like this plot a little better because you can actually um, get more information about the, the, the value of the couplings involved. There's a lot of theoretical activity. Uh, this is a plot that Sasha Bellier made of papers on the archive of uh, different topics. Uh, dark matter, of course, is something that is going very strong. Um, I think you cut it off about here because probably the Higgs went through the roof at this point. <laughs> at least I couldn't find an updated version of it. Okay, so the meat of what I want to talk about has more to do with how we think about constructing models of dark matter, um, where this has gone and, and where it's going. And I think, like I said, it's a very interesting story that has a lot of lessons for snow mass. This is how I organize theories. We were actually talking about this at lunch a little bit, uh, though this was not a useful uh, component of that conversation. I kind of think about theories as far as how complete they are. UV complete models are things that I think might actually describe the world up to the gut scale or, or the Planck scale. So, you know, something like uh, supersymmetry, for example. Simplified models maybe have a few of the ingredients that are necessary. And of course, there's a limit where all particles are, are heavy other than say the dark matter itself, where things go into a, a set of uh, relativistic effective field theories. And I think there are lessons to be learned by looking at all of the different uh, types of theories that populate this axis. Uh, this is a Venn diagram I made for SNOMAS 2013. Uh, it's all of the theories of dark matter that I knew about at the time. Uh, 
I don't know if its value is scientific or artistic, but um, it was fun to make. Uh, it's interesting though, that I probably wouldn't have bothered to make it this year. <laughs> and so I wanna say something about that because I think that is sort of, that for me characterizes the difference between how we thought about dark matter uh, 10 years ago and how we think about it now. So where were we? Well, in 2013, we were in Minneapolis. <laughs> And there, uh, the dominant player uh, that we were talking about in terms of theories of dark matter was supersymmetry. So technically that goes all the way back to when we were doing snow mass and snow mass itself. Uh, so of course, the dark matter, you know, originally was usually thought of as sort of a, a side hustle, if you want. You had a great theory of solving the hierarchy problem. You wanted to solve the strong CP problem. And guess what? You got dark matter. And that actually was very fruitful. And it's interesting that both those examples gave us the WIMP and the Axion, which if you want, are kind of emblemic of all the types of dark matter that we know. <laughs> they all live in one of those two regimes. Either they have relatively large couplings and symmetries that stabilize them, or they're relatively light with, with, or have weak, very weak couplings such that they are stable and live, around, live long enough to be here today. So of course the MSSM was the one that received more attention just because it was a complicated and interesting theory. Uh, it had about a hundred free parameters. There was a common theory that was already sort of becoming a little bit passe at that time. And that's because the LHC was starting to give us information that didn't favor it. This theory was called minimal supergravity or MSUGRA. It reduced the hundred quantities to four plus one. And of course you could never call that five and I could never figure out why. But these were the kind of plots we got with MSUGRA. We had to specify uh, the common scalar mass, the common um, triaxial coupling among the scalars. We had to specify the gay genome mass parameter, uh, tangent beta, and then the sign of mu. So of course the plus one was because one of them was just a sign, it was plus or minus. And you could see that there was actually a lot of very rich structure in here. I mean, it was kind of interesting that when we started to look at neutralinos as dark matter, we were looking at WIMPs, but we were actually looking at one of the hardest to understand because they have so many free parameters and so many knobs you can play with that, uh, I mean, the joke, the joke at the Fermilab theory group at the time was that the discovery of supersymmetry would never be possible without the invention of the color printer. <laughs> we don't even use paper anymore. <laughs> anyway. And of course, uh, this is a, a, a result from SnowMass itself by the Slack group. This is an attempt to actually look at not 100 of the free parameters, but about 20 or so of them and do a scan over them and then characterize them based on what types of experiments um, had some hope of seeing them or not. And there were interesting trends you could see, you know, the fact that these dots are not sort of uniformly distributed by color tells you that these experiments are probing different regions of mass space and coupling space. Uh, and something that I was involved in around that time was also looking at contact interactions. So that was an attempt to be a little more agnostic. This is an example, which I don't want to go through in uh, any detail. Uh, it basically describes all the leading operators that would allow quarks and gluons to interact with a Majorana, a dark matter particle. It turns out that there were 10 such operators that are consistent with Lorentz and gauge invariants. Uh, they describe WIMPs coupling to quarks or gluons. Um, and of course, you know, the EFT approach is you just write everything down, you give it a separate coefficient, and then you ask what you can say about the coefficients. And of course, the problem with the EFT approach is that any realistic UV theory is going to know that there are correlations between these things and uh, going to turn some of them on and not others. And you may lose out on that when you try to do things this way. Uh, but there were still interesting things we could learn. So of these 10 different types of interactions, it turns out only two of them corresponded to spin independent elastic scattering. So direct detection, which was already at that time, you know, some of the most stringent constraints on, um, on WIMP theories uh, was actually really only talking about two of these things. Spin dependent was just talking about one of them. Annihilation in the galactic halo was suppressed by the fact that it's non-relativistic there, unless you had uh, four of them, which interestingly enough are not four that overlap with direct detection, which told you that you could actually build a theory that would be give a large signal in one and not the other. And colliders, because they were producing things relativistically, were more or less sensitive to all of them. 
Uh, so, you know, that allowed us to start talking about complementarity and the fact that these searches were all kind of trying to talk about the same thing. They were all talking about how dark matter interacts with the standard model. Uh, and so, you know, there was a real legitimate question from the funding agencies, do we have to do all three of these? Isn't it enough to do one of them? And I mean, you can guess from the answer I just gave that it, the answer is no, because uh, you have to do all three of them. Uh, and that's because you really can't cover any kind of reasonable uh, space, even of UV models, uh, unless you actually uh, do more than one of them. So these again were plots we made for SNOMAS. And it was interesting that it was about this time of SNOMAS 2013 that we started to think uh, less about specific visions of dark matter and more about, well, can we just say something generic in some way? And so that actually led us to a better understanding of engineering for dark matter theories. Uh, for example, and this is one that I worked on with Flip Tenedo, who's in the audience today. If you wanted to explain that galactic center excess as a signal of dark matter annihilation, but avoid strong constraints from direct searches, we actually knew how to do that. We knew a vector interaction was a disaster because the points that would fit the galactic center excess so this is using the data from the Fermi collaboration, turning it into what the cross section should be in the assumption that you have a vector like interaction between the dark matter and say quarks, and then turning that into a, a self independent, a spin independent um, scattering cross section, you found something that was actually already ruled out by Lux. If you use the pseudo scalar interaction, um, you know, so imagine that there's an axion like particle that acts as the mediator, you ended up with something that you'll be hard pressed to discover, you know, even with the very best experiments that we have coming online. And again, it's very easy to understand this once you actually, you know, look at these operators and how they scale with the velocity of the particles that are interacting. Um, but it was, but we, we now know how to do that. So this is where we are today in the frozen north. Um, a compromise is to include some of the important mediator particles as well as the dark matter. And this allows us to discuss the mediators at, at colliders more robustly. So the worry at colliders is always that, you know, does the EFT actually even live in a regime that applies to the collider? And of course that just depends on what the mass of the mediator is. Um, it also allows you to delve into important theoretical considerations. Like for example, if your mediator particle is a vector, then there should be some kind of dark Higgs sector. There's a dark gauge invariance. We need particles to cancel gauge anomalies, et cetera, et cetera. And some of these details do matter for phenomenology. Uh, it also lets you just look for the mediators themselves directly. And so here are some examples of CMS and Atlas doing that. So more importantly, where we're going, and I at least think many of us here are going to Seattle sometime in July. Uh, these days, the way we think about dark matter theories is actually somewhat different. So kind of a nice case point is looking at dark photons. So this is the limit where I take that previous theory with a vector mediator. I make it very light. Uh, it, and we learned since doing that, that uh, this allows us to perhaps arrange for the relic density to turn out correctly for very light MeV dark matter. The standard model doesn't really have particles in the right mass range for MeV dark matter. If you try to couple strongly enough to electrons, you are usually ruled out. Um, and so, and you have a very nice natural explanation for the small coupling of the mediator to the standard model by assuming they come from kinetic mixing with U1 hypercharge. So we call it a dark photon because its interactions look like a photon's coupling, but they're scaled down by small, some small parameter epsilon. And this regime motivates all different kinds of searches, including for long lived or low mass, ultra weakly uh, interacting particles, things that we weren't really looking for uh, to a large extent back then. And so one of the things that characterizes dark matter uh, theory as it's applied today, and I have to apologize because there were literally about 20 different things I could put on this slide. I picked two of them uh, related to the, the, the dark photon. For example, we can have new experiments um, well, we could have new interpretations of, of experiments we plan to do, like for example, Bell 2, or even old experiments like Babar. New experiments were proposed and run like dark light, things like LDMX um, hope to actually take a big bite out of this parameter space. Uh, and if we assume that there's a decay largely in divisible channels, 
there's a whole set of other experiments that we'll look at. This is from the Cosmic Visions report in 2017. So much of this, uh, these new experiments that are being you know, realized, planned, projected, they're all an outgrowth of the fact that dark matter theories are being constructed to try to look at a new regime, the MEV scale. Uh, we also have an important class of uh, searches related to, say, astronomical probes. Dark matter that has interesting dynamics on large scales could leave its imprint on the structure of the universe. So just as an example, if you have large self interactions, you could retain the successes of describing large scale structure, but then show measurable differences at the smallest scales. Um, these observations have driven attention to how we simulate the impact of baryonic matter on simulations of how galaxies form, um, leading to better <laughs> predictions. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and then astronomy provides a unique perspective on properties of particle searches, uh, properties that particle searches can't really probe. This is a summary by um, Annika, Peter, and Matt Buckley that's actually quite nice on the subject. Uh, and finally, there's a large area of activity in which we explore theories that are just really leading to new directions for what dark matter is doing. Um, given how little we know about it, this is a, a healthy and reasonable approach. Just ask, well, wait a minute, are we really sure that all the dark matter is non-relativistic? Maybe some of it is actually relativistic. This was explored uh, in this paper, which actually Jesse uh, was a co-author of. And the idea is that some of the dark matter is turning itself into a lighter species that is relativistic. And that of course leads to new ways that we can look for it. Um, or the dark matter could be some kind of pion-like object in a confined theory uh, with a flavor symmetry that's sort of vaguely reminiscent of QCD. And that's a good uh, model for how uh, dark matter might be self-interacting with a large interaction cross-section. Dark matter is also a probe of the conditions of the early universe. Uh, this is a, a plot from a recent paper uh, by myself and my student, uh, Jessica Howard et al. Uh, and that is to say Shada Ipek and uh, Jessica Turner, uh, where we looked at a theory where we actually took what Raman called one of the control knobs of the universe. We assumed it controls the, the weak coupling constant and we made an ordinary WIMP uh, freeze out during a time when SU2 is confined. Then, of course, later on, we have to turn that knob back and make it look like the universe that we live in. It turns out in that case, you favor, um, you favor higher dark matter masses such that a theory that would be totally ruled out if you had, um, if you, uh, yeah, a theory that you could never have predicted the right amount of dark matter um, based on freeze out now becomes natural because what freezes out are some kind of dark pions that are made of dark matter bound with standard model particles uh, rather than just ordinary plain vanilla WIMPs. Okay, and there's a lot of uh, development of new theoretical tools. I'm sorry that I'm out of time. For example, nuclear EFTs to describe dark matter scattering with nuclei, uses of things like soft and collinear effective theory to describe gamma rays from uh, we know annihilation. And okay, like I said, you really can't do justice to this in 20 minutes. Uh, the way I think about this is that we started with a lamppost, we looked under a lamppost, and we were given a lamppost that had wimps and axions in it. At the time of 2013, and that snow mass, we had already started to look at the edges of the lamppost and try to see what was out there beyond. And the situation we find ourselves in today looks something like this. And each one of these little theoretical investigations is its own lamppost, which then allows us to maybe try to fill in some of the dark spaces in between. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, for this nice review. Time for questions. Yes. Hi, thank you for the nice talk. So you, you briefly mentioned at the end this nuclear response EFT. Um, now that there's a lot of interest in sort of lighter scale dark matter experiments, uh, is there a similar is there similar work on an EFT on responses for condensed matter systems, or is that something that's interesting to think about? Uh, that is something that's interesting to think about, and I mean, there's certainly a lot of work done just in modeling what the response is, which, if you want, is the EFT that you're describing. Uh, I'm not sure that it's reached sort of the level of sophistic sophistication of the nuclear response EFT, and that's largely because I think we're just trying to characterize even the response of the things that are likely to be large. Um, but certainly that is something that we see the development is happening right now. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? 
Got one online. Uh, Alexi, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, ask your question? Sure. Um, I, I'm just curious. So in the beginning, uh, normally people talk about three different ways of probing dark matter, and you made it into four. So why not make it five with the standard model coming in and standard model coming out? I mean, most of the um, collider probes, well, not most of them, but some of the collider probes are just like that, right? I mean, you look for uh, axion decays to plus and minus or... Um, you know, there are contributions of some dark matter models to, I don't know, G minus two. Um, um, absolutely, I agree. I mean, and, and this slide is uh, an example of them doing just that, right? This is a process that involves the mediator particle, but doesn't actually have dark matter in it at all. So yeah, maybe I need a fourth cartoon on my slide. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else in the room? Thank Tim again.